All right, so we're going to start to survey then the different animal phyla. And first, I'm going to talk a little bit about life without a backbone, the invertebrates. And then we're going to launch into our first phylum, which is the what? Phylum periphera. All right, so the invertebrates, life without a backbone. So you're an invertebrate if you lack a backbone or spinal column. Okay, quite straightforward really, isn't it? Animals that lack a backbone or spinal column. And they comprise about 95% of all known animal species, the invertebrates. Okay, there's lots of them, by far the most diverse. We're talking about things like the sponges, good. And we're talking about things like the jellies. Now, we used to be able to call them jellyfish. Now, that's sort of gone away. The marine biologists don't like it. We've got to call them jellies, all right, which doesn't sound nearly as good as jellyfish, does it? No, but they're not fish at all. So the jellies, it's phylum nideria. And it includes organisms like tapeworms, which are organs in the phylum Platyhelminthes. And organisms like this. What's this little guy? It's a rotifer. All right? Tiny little multi-celled organism. There are some protists that are, uh, I guess, as big, maybe a little bit bigger than these. And organisms like this. This is a, you can state the obvious. It's a worm, good. What kind of worm? It's an unsegmented nematode worm. Nematodes are awesome. When we talk about nematodes, I'm gonna tell you about all the nematode parasites that you could get. And some of you might have. And we're talking about these, things like earthworms, the annelid worms, the segmented worms. And organisms like this. What is this little guy? It's actually not a mite. It's quite, not a bad guess. It is. It's called a water bear or a tardy grade. Now, they're not this color. This is a colorized scanning electron micrograph. All right? We're actually not going to talk about this phylum. Maybe, I, maybe I'll include it one year because they're fascinating. And organisms like this. This is an good in the phylum. Mollusk, mollusca, good. And it is a cephalopod. And things like this. This is a scorpion. It's an arachnid, all right? And then things like this. This is a starfish. I think we should call it a sea star, though. I think starfish is sort of maybe not allowed anymore. I'm not quite sure. But it's an echinoderm. All right? Now, believe it or not, this, in terms of its sort of the time at which it diverged, fairly recent. It's pretty close to you. Closer to you than octopuses, for example, which doesn't seem to make sense, does it? And then we've got these. These are the what? These are the most advanced, the most, I guess, evolutionary recent of every animal I've showed you. These are very close to you. In fact, they're in your phylum, believe it or not. Anybody know what these are? It's a tunica. Good, a sea squirt. How can that be closely related to you? Doesn't seem possible, does it? But it is. When you look at its characteristics, especially its development, you'll see it's quite closely related to you. Doesn't have a spinal cord column, but it's got something called um, a notochord, which puts it into your phylum, phylum chordata. All right, now we're talking about the chordates with a backbone. So we've got a fish, they've got a backbone, they're vertebrates. Sorry? Oh, this doesn't exist in nature. This is one of those oddities that we've managed to come up with from artificial breeding, right? Just like corn. Corn doesn't exist in nature, does it? Sorry? 
or the pug, right? Or any of those dog breeds. All right, so here we got some little frogs, little poison dart frogs. I don't know what genus they're in, but they're amphibians. And now, of course, we've got the reptiles. And then we've got a completely separate group, the birds. Right? Wrong. Okay, birds are in the same group as reptiles, remember? Yep, not a separate group. It used to be, not anymore. And then, of course, you've got us, the mammals, all right? The group that we're in. So we've just, like, zipped through really quickly most of the groups that we're going to look at. And you're going to understand their biology and be able to define them. Okay, so with each phylum, we're going to look at its phylogenetic tree, its phylogeny, and we're going to go through roughly in order of divergence. All right, so who have got a common ancestor of all animals? The first group to diverge or to, to branch off were the sponges, phylum periphera. And then we've got all of the other animal groups. Now, these phylogenies show group names that are not the classic Linnaean group names, okay? For most of the invertebrates, I'm going to use the Linnaean group names, the phylum and the classes and so on. They're still sort of generally accepted and in the textbooks, but we're moving over. For the chordates, we pretty much moved over a lot, away from the Linnaean names and onto clades, clade names, which have come about through phylogenetics. So I'll make that transition later in the semester. So for now, we're going to talk about phylum periphera. All right, common name are the sponges, and they're the animals that lack true tissues. So you remember the cross-section of the sponge that we saw in lab? You could see some distinct layers, couldn't you? Do you remember the coanocyte layer around the canals? There's, it's got coanocyte cells, and there's some other cells mixed in right behind it, and there's no separation with any sort of membranous layer from one type of cell to another. And that's why we say it doesn't have true tissues, because it just seems to be the cells mixed together with no separation. What's the, what does periphera literally mean? Anybody know? Pore Pore bearing. Yep, they have pores, little holes. And they're sedentary animals. And they live primarily in marine habitats, but you've also got freshwater sponges. Now, before we had synthetic sponges, our sponges were real sponges, right? Mostly from a marine environment. You would take the sponge, you would simply let it dry, wash off all the gelatinous mass and dead cells, and what you're left with is the skeleton of the sponge, and that's what we would use as a sponge. All right, so again, there's the phylogenetics. We're going to look at the phylum periphera. All right, not SpongeBob. He's synthetic, okay? Not a real natural sponge. But there's a real natural sponge. Once all the living tissues are gone, and that's what we might think of as our classic sponge. Oh, sorry, I thought I fixed this. Okay, so I want to show you the sponge, once all the living tissue's gone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm recording the lecture. Maybe we can not. Tell. Sorry? We can tell. Yeah. Alright, start recording. Uh. Now you're recording it again. I am. I want it to go from the slide.
There's a real natural sponge. <laughs> All right. So this is what some other sponges look like. Sometimes if you go to a, a marine environment, you'll see something on a rock, crusted on a rock, and you really won't know what it is. All right? But very often, it's a sponge. You don't know what it is because there's nothing really tangible for you to look at. It just looks like this kind of blob. But they've got, oftentimes, beautiful colors. There's a red one. There's a blue one. What are the clues that this is a sponge or these are a group of sponges? The osculum. That's one. What else? The other pores. What are these other pores called? Singular ostium, plural ostia. Yep, good. And you can poke them and they feel like a sponge. All right. Look at that one. That's a pretty cool sponge. Look at those fish that are completely camouflaged within it. It looks comfy, doesn't it? Yeah, it's memory foam. <laughs> or you've got sponges that look like that. That's kind of similar to the finger sponge that we looked at in lab, a little bit at least anyway. But the common feature is there are these pores and there's an X current opening called an osculum. All right, so sponges then are suspension feeders. They don't have big teeth and they don't track down prey. They're suspension feeders. And they capture small food particles suspended in the water that passes through their body. So the pores that are in their body walls, water's drawn in through those pores and it's drawn in by the action of flagella. There are many flagellated cells that line the canals inside the sponge. The flagella beat and they create a water current and the water is drawn in through the pores and then pushed into the central cavity of the sponge which is called a sponger seal and then the water is ejected out through the osculum. Now, on its journey through, any suspended particles get trapped within mucus that's secreted by these flagellated cells. And I'll show you a diagram of how that is then absorbed into the cell. So you can take a sponge, and you can actually drip some ink onto it in the water, and you'll see where the ink is pulled in through the pores and ejected out through the osculum, and a bunch of that ink will be then trapped within the body of the sponge in the mucus. No true tissues or organs. So one of the cell types in a sponge is called a coanocyte. And they're flagellated, collared cells. What does a flagellated cell have? A flagellum. All right, a flagellum. And that flagellum is very, very similar to the flagellum on your sperm cells. All right, it's virtually no different. So these flagellated cells, they've also got a collar, and they've got a sort of bulbous part to the other end, and the action of the flagellum creates this water current. So the body of the sponge then consists of this spicule skeleton, and between the spicules is this gelatinous like non-cellular layer. There are some cells in it but, but not very many. They're sporadic, they're spread around and they secrete this sort of gelatinous like layer. And that gelatinous like layer is called the mesohyl. The other major cell type in the sponge is called an amoebocyte. And they're found in the mesohyl associated with the flagellated cells and they have a role in digesting the food particles that get captured by the coanocytes and laying down spicules and this gelatinous layer as well. They're really a jack of all trades in many ways. So most sponges then are hermaphrodites. That means each individual can produce male and female gametes. But they tend to reproduce sexually, not with themselves. They can release sperm cells, which can get trapped by another sponge. They don't go, one sponge doesn't go meet another, right? They don't hop up and walk around. There's no courtship that goes on. They're attached to a substrate, 
they'll release sperm. Those sperm, just by chance, will get drawn into another sponge. And those sperm then may fertilize some eggs in the other sponge. They've got a very, very basic radial nerve net. So they do have sort of the rudiments of nerve tissue. All right, so let's have a look at what that looks like, at least in diagram then. So here's our sponge seal. There's our osculum. There are the ostia or the pores. There are the channels that are going to, there's the pore that draws in the water. It's going to go through these channels in the body wall. Water then is going to go into the sponge seal and be ejected out. The water currents are created by these flagellated coanocytes, which not just line the sponge seal, but they line all of these canals within the body wall of the sponge, as you saw in the cross section. So if we have a look up close at these coanocytes, there's the flagella, flagellum, there's the collar, there's the cell body, and there's an amoebocyte associated with it. So small particles of food get trapped in mucus that's secreted. The mucus is taken in by phagocytosis, gets moved through the cells, some digestion is going to occur, then it gets moved to the amoebocyte where digestion takes place. All right. So they're pretty indiscriminate about what they feed on. If it's a small particle that gets caught in the mucus, they'll take it in. If it's digestible, it gets broken down. If not, it's just released. Okay. Good so far? And there's a picture of the finger sponge, Grantia, that you saw in lab today. Or, you, or the other day. This is a longitudinal section through the sponge. There's your osculum. Oh, what's this center cavity called? A something a seal, right? A sponge a seal. And there we've got our radial canals. What direction does the water move? From here to here or from here out that way? First one. First one from the outside in, the sponge seal. And it gets pushed out through the osculum. There's our in-current pores. And there's lots of canals that run throughout the sponge. Once you remove all the genatus layer and the cells and the water, you can see why they're so spongy, can't you? Yeah. All right, again, we saw this in lab. So what would you find if you were right just there? What would you find right just there? What would you be surrounded by? Water. Yeah, one of those canals that moves water. What about if I was right just there? What would I, what would I be in? Mesa Hill, yeah, that genatus layer. So what are these darkly stained cells? Coanocytes, probably some amoebocytes to the outside. And here we've got some amoebocytes that are stained in the Mesa Hill. Good. And of course, the basic skeleton of the sponge is made up of a couple of different substances, but spicules form the main inorganic component. And spicules can be made of either calcium carbonate or silica. Okay, silica is what glass is made of. Calcium carbonate is super abundant and they, they lay them down into these beautiful shapes. That's what forms the basic structure. And there's also some proteins, one called spongin, which helps hold things together as well. That's the basic structure of the sponge. I love these scanning electron micrographs. They're really beautiful, but that's a scanning electron micrograph. And what blows me away is that an organism so simple as a sponge made this. You know, it looks like it's manufactured, doesn't it? I mean, look, there's a perfect point to it almost. Perfect straight lines. I bet this angle is consistent among all of these spicules. It's just amazing. And there, remove all the live tissue, and this would be the spicule skeleton of this sponge. Good? That's it. Phylum periphera. Now you can go. So I would use a combination of lab manual, 
and the slides and the textbook. Between those three, your lab manual honestly covers almost all of them. Slides do, and your textbook does most of them. Okay? Yep. Yeah.